Hi, my name is Rob Garrison. I'm the CEO of Mercado Labs. Welcome to the sixth edition of First Things First, where we introduce you to thought leaders from across industry, media, and venture. Last month's guest was Debbie Ryan. Debbie is the Director of Procurement for Logic Source, and Debbie's got a really long storied career in the supply chain. So she shared with us her personal journey, some of the things she loves about the supply chain, some of the challenges she has, and also what advice she would give to young people just starting out. So it's a great episode, and I hope you'll check that out. Today's guest is Mark Baxa. I'm really thrilled to have Mark on the show. Mark is the president and CEO of the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals, or CSCMP for short. He's also the president and CEO of Fernia Creek Consulting. And uh, I would encourage you to check that out. We've got a, a link to his website in the notes. Mark's just an incredible resource. He's, he's been in international trade his whole career, and he's great for consulting for you or giving you advice on trade, compliance, any issue really with regard to the international supply chain. So check that out. Um, Mark has an, also an incredible background in supply chain, as I mentioned, and I know you'll get to enjoy hearing from him as well. So congratulations to Deborah Joaquim for being the recipient of episode five's Let's Talk Supply Chain Blended Diversity Pledge. Uh, once again, Mercado will be donating $100 to this great cause on behalf of one of today's listeners. So if you're listening, I'd encourage you to any comments in the show, any shout outs, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, so let's now dive into a segment that we call The Fastest Five. And unfortunately, I, I continue to hope that one of these months I'm going to report some really positive news on the supply chain. But unfortunately, I've had to title this episode, The Hits Just Keep On Coming. So last month, I talked about uh, many retailers are struggling with excess inventory, which is caused by misforecasts. And so just to, to kind of give you the root cause of that, when retailers were planning those orders back in January, things were much different back then. We hadn't started the war with Hungary. As an example, uh, interest rates were termed as transitory at the time. Demand was actually still pretty strong back in January. And so, of course, you know, look fast forward to the June and everything changed. All of those conditions I just talked about had changed, which caused them to have way more product than they needed for demand. So lots of retailers out there struggling with excess inventory. I say that to say this. When we look at this uh, year's peak season, which is about to start, usually in earnest, about August, happens every year. It's normal to have a peak season. I expect there to be one. The holidays haven't gone away, so there will be a peak season. It may be tempered just a bit, though, because of all that excess retailer, excess uh, supply. Sorry. If you're a retailer and you've got excess supply, you're going to be pretty conservative about ordering more products um, going forward. It's kind of the once bitten, twice shy type of thing. So we'll see what happens. There'll be a peak, but it may be a little bit tempered. So now we're going to talk about this much challenge, which is uh, global unrest in key markets around the world. Uh, manufacturing hubs, I call them, such as Sri Lanka, Myanmar and Pakistan, all of them are facing both economic and political turmoil. Uh, this, I want to shout out to Chuck Dabrosiak and Manu Sanai for this article from the Sourcing Journal. So let's begin with Sri Lanka. Uh, if you haven't seen that on the news, check it out. It's unbelievable uh, what's happening there. But it's there's huge political unrest. And so therefore, the nearly $6 billion garment industry is also facing some challenges. The Prime Minister of Sri Lanka has resigned amidst massive protests there, the, what I'm talking about in the news, and the new government has been installed. So currently, as it stands today, ports are still operating and fuel is available. So hopefully the workers remain safe and they'll be able to continue earning wages. And as it appears for now, for now, the manufacturing community is continuing to take a country first approach to this. They want you know continued employment. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. It's, it's tenuous, but for right now, the manufacturing is ongoing. Myanmar, on the other hand, is facing a very different situation. There's massive labor unrest and fuel shortages there, which are causing factories to shut down, and it doesn't appear there's any end in sight to that. So as uh, in addition to that, there's labor campaigners out there pushing for a complete shutdown of apparel operations and protests. So I hope you'll all say a prayer for the workers in Myanmar, as well as to a peaceful resolution of that conflict. Uh, lastly, let's take a look at Pakistan, where they've got yet another issue. They've got a lack of affordable gas and electricity, uh, which has forced already 400 textile mills in the Punjab province to shut down. Pakistan generates uh, approximately $20 billion in textile exports. Uh, so it's a massive industry. However, soaring energy prices are making it nearly impossible 
um, for them to continue operations. And so this last story is uh, sort of an interesting one. The CEO of Gap has resigned in part due to supply chain issues. And I'll make this quick because I want to introduce my guest. But basically, late arriving inventory, as well as a lack of inventory, caused Gap to miss their sales by $162 million in the first quarter. So they're in the midst of a turnaround. It wasn't the good news. She's now resigned. And in the interim, uh, the, the uh, CEO has appointed a member of their board to take over in the interim. So let's all hope that this iconic but struggling brand has a rapid turnaround and a rapid recovery. Okay, so with that, I'd like to introduce our guest, the none other than Mark Baxter. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be with everybody, Rob. Thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, thank, I, I really, really, really am looking forward to this episode, Mark. I want to start with congratulating you because last time we talked, you were the interim uh, charge of CSMCP, and you've now been officially appointed the full-time president and CEO. So I thought um, I'd like for the listeners to hear about your personal journey. But before we get started on that, before we go into that, which is awesome, can you please tell the listeners about uh, CSMCP? You know, what is it? What is your charter and how can folks engage? Well, great question. And uh, it, the mission of CSCMP is uh, well stated and has been for a long time. We're here to educate and to provide a framework for education and networking of all seasoned supply chain professionals, students alike, and those that have actually exited their career professionally and are into retirement because there's an opportunity to give back. It's really a great organization that's founded on the principles of the supply chain itself, initially uh, around distribution and operations, and then became the Council of Logistics Management, or CLM, and now CSCMP the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals. And we've been there, I believe, since 2005. We really are here to help supply chain professionals sharpen their saw, become more competent and capable in functioning within their role in the supply chain, whether you're just entering, about to enter as a student, if you will, coming into the profession, academics uh, portraying their research in the positive light that practitioners can translate that into actionable uh, if you will, opportunities for improvement. And then finally, educating your ongoing career and bringing you the latest and greatest in research and technologies uh, that help you translate that into innovation as well as problem solving and advancing yourself as a, as a supply chain professional throughout your entire career. I've been a part of CSCMP since 1998 when I was given this crazy, incredible task of preparing our supply chain to move a doubling of sales from the current year within two years. And it's just like, how do you even spell that? How do you create that, right? <laughs> so at that time I found Maria McIntyre, who was the who was the CEO of CSCMP. She introduced me to a very large big box retailer somewhere in Arkansas who remained nameless. <laughs> I got That's to begin with the W, right? Yeah, I got to meet the vice president of transportation, a great woman leader. Not that that really matters, but it was kind of cool in a time when that was very hard to find, actually. Okay. Now it's much more prevalent, still needs to be better. But anyway, the point is that she gave me an hour and a half, member to member, of creating a framework which I need to go down and a path I needed to lead to. Our, our organization. And it was just a, a great connection. I've never left since. So uh, I've served on the board of the, the association, just kind of jumping into my career. I've been in uh, supply chain for quite some time in and out of various different roles and had the opportunity to lead uh, large teams of people to do some really, really great things for not only the business, but for society and support some of the non-government organizations and supplier diversity based organizations to actually build out small, medium enterprises, invite business owners to really become part of the overall supply chain process. And a fair amount of that has really been done and get in the form of giving back. And I believe in that. And I know many do in our profession because we don't have the answers ourselves. Uh, we're better as a collective rather than we are individually. But anyway, so I, uh, I've enjoyed a great, uh, great career. I uh, retired from Monsanto Bear in 19, I'm sorry, in 2018. Started my own consulting firm, all the while still volunteering with CSCM. I chaired the organization in 2019. And when Rick Blasgen retired in uh, March of, of 21, they asked me uh, to join up and, and take the role on an interim basis. And well, 
that turned into a more a, a role of permanency. So I'm I'm here for the uh, for the long haul and happy to do it. I have so many questions, Mark. <laughs> I have so many questions. So first of all, um, you mentioned Fernia Creek. I was doing some research on you, so I saw you started that company. What the heck is a Fernia Creek? Yes, yeah, so, yeah. So I was thinking about the name of the company, and you know, for one reason or another, when you think about nature, it has a connection. So I was listening to. Uh, to the radio one day and I'm thinking, what am I going to call my company? I don't want to name it after myself because what if I want to transfer ownership and you get into all that later in life? And I didn't want to do that. So I heard this name, I'll just name it Bamboo HR. And I'm thinking, what does Bamboo have to do with HR? And it was a really cool company. So immediately I thought to my roots, which is in, are in the upper peninsula of Michigan. We vacationed there for just many, many years. All started back in the 1920s when my dad's father found it. My grandfather discovered this lake. Anyway, Fernia Creek is one of the tributaries that feed uh, McDonald Lake and the upper peninsula. So I thought this is perfect, right? So uh, that's how the name came about. Really, really uh, cool. I made for a great logo. Uh, my wife gets all the credit for developing the logo of the company. She did it on a napkin while we're eating pizza one day in California. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my son is a marketer and he put it all together and well, the rest is history. Yeah, so truly, truly a bootstrap story, Mark. I as an entrepreneur, I love that story. Yeah. Um, let me take that a couple of different directions. Just for the show, for the audience, Mark and I got spent a couple of minutes talking about the beautiful UP of Michigan. If you haven't been up there, I really would encourage you. Michigan sometimes gets a bad rap. If you go to the UP of Michigan, you'll have a wholly different impression. Um, so, Mark, you gave a great case study about when you were in industry and you were sort of struggling with a big challenge, how to how to make your supply chain accommodate double the sales growth, which indeed is a massive challenge a lot of people are facing. And you were able to find somebody to give you a hand up. How would you recommend that people listening to this podcast do the same? I mean, is that something that's available to your membership where they can come to CSMCP with the challenge that they're facing and uh, CSMCP will help them find somebody who might be able to help them along that journey? Yeah, that's absolutely why we exist. Uh, pairing people with uh, comparable expertise or just finding someone to bounce ideas off of who have been down that path. And of course, we're living in an era where that's not so common because we're all learning together. But John Maxwell said it best. And I, I like to think about it this way in simple terms. If you want to know what's on the road ahead, ask somebody on the way back. And that's really the value of networking. People who have been down that path before can share wisdom and experiences. And currently where we are today, we're, we're all learning together. But CSCMP exists for that very, very purpose. Whether it's core foundational education you need about the planning process, transportation, you know, sourcing or customer service, any of the components of what we would call the functional supply chain, that's one set. The other is that peer-to-peer -peer networking or really, you know, if, if you will, where you are in your career reaching up to someone that has had a broader experience, either leading an organization or just working on significant projects can share the, the if you will, the ins and outs, the risks and the rewards that they experience. So maybe you don't take certain paths and it helps you accelerate your own personal investigative journey before you start kicking something off. Supply chain is very dynamic. I mean, everybody knows that. You're in supply chain today. You especially get that. And we're all feeling, as leaders, we're feeling the daily compression of risk, fear, and solving for challenges that just kind of get in the way of more fluidity, evenness, right? A, a constraint-free or near-constraint-free supply chain. We're, we're all discovering things new, fresh, and, and if you will, not so inviting almost every day. We've got inventory imbalances around the world. We got we have suppliers that we work with that aren't as predictable and they're not as supportive as they used to be, not because they don't want to be, but they're facing the same challenges. So that part about really building, if you will, inherent resiliency and how do I do that in the most cost effective way? How do I add value added redundancy so that I can be a more credible, reliable supplier either to the business that needs my stuff or to the consumer that wants to buy my things? Look, here, here's where we are today. This, this is like, how can CSCMP really help? We're all in the soup together. And we're all in different places in solving for the problems. And every industry, every vertical is going to look different, depending on how you actually designed your business also matters in terms of where your footprint's at. Decisions that really kind of started back in 2018 when 
the China-based tariffs went into impact that were to effect. All of a sudden, many businesses here in the U.S. were faced with a 25 percent increase in cost of goods. And there really was no way out of it immediately. You had to really either be ready to do that in some form of a, a, a network design that was already in place where you could alternatively source or alternatively buy. But if you weren't in that position, and very few were, you were scrambling to figure out how are we going to offset this? Is this even believable? What do we do with these costs? Do we pass them on to the consumer? This is so sudden and earth shattering. And then came the human health pandemic, which created a, an insurmountable amount of variability that we just really couldn't manage. We couldn't control because our, our bodies were sick, right? And we were losing our ability to have a consistent, reliable workforce in addition to the other challenges that we were facing. You know, and one example I give and how we've helped people as, as a council is bringing together like-mindedness of people who are problem solvers with those who have the problem. And although there isn't any fast solution because supply chains, as we all know, are very complex. And we had to move away from what we called a more optimized, innovative kind of line of thinking around, you know, near zero inventory, inventory balances, reducing working capital costs and working inventory costs. All of those things, plus many more, were out the window almost immediately because now we're trying to figure out how to navigate through all this wide net of variability, which just in the end was just nothing more than risk. So we brought together in so many different forms and different venues, either through roundtables or our annual edge conference or just all of the education content we're creating, partnering with anybody that had a, a reasonable part of the whole bigger pie of solutions, inviting them in and bringing this to our members and in some cases our guests. We always welcome guests to anything that we do, but it's definitely the better place to be if you're a member because you just have better access to information and people. So we're helping solve these problems. We're not the end all. I would never say anybody's got the complete solution. And if they do or the complete venue for solutions, I would say they're selling you short. You have to really be a student of the business today from an intelligence gathering perspective. But we are helping, I'd say, in a considerable way uh, in that space. And the other thing we're doing, too, Rob, is we're looking at that executive profile. As an association, we, we've done really well with students and academics and either mid-career, you know, mid-career all the way up through maybe that director level. And then when you get to the executive level, we've said, OK, you need to start really giving more back than taking. And I don't think that's a fair position to be in, because just like the, the CEO of Gap that was terminated because of supply chain reasons. Well, I'll tell you what, there's probably a domino effect who's in charge of supply chain at, at Gap. So all companies are facing these kinds of challenges. So helping that executive profile develop as leaders, people leaders, as, as well as kind of the knowledge expert of the business, you got to understand, you have to understand how to manage forward. And all of it's not just in the four walls of your company. So where are those tentacles into opportunities to learn, grow and develop right now for the intelligence that's needed? And we're about to unveil something that's really cool. I think that uh, CSCMP will uh, definitely bolster its place in the in the executive profile. Hey, we always want to do breaking news, Mark, if you're about ready to make an announcement. Well, you know, <laughs> it, it's forthcoming uh, wow. we'll be okay. very soon, but uh, but I've kind of given the idea. I think you're going to get uh, a pretty good sense. Your, your listeners will of what we're going to do. But uh, there's a lot of cool things inside of this this executive profile of how we're addressing uh, the executive's needs. That are well, going to be this, different because of the content that we have as well. This is where I'd like to take this next. A lot to un unpack there. Thank you for that comprehensive overview. I mean, it's it's overwhelming. I was trying to take some notes. I was talking to this overwhelming when you talk about the different issues. Uh, again, going back to 2018 that you've mentioned from tariffs to inventory challenges, et cetera. So I want to take it either one of two directions. Um, just I'll give you some thought about this and then I'm going to ask you a quick question from a listener. Um, one direction is you mentioned the early roots of CSMCP as sort of distribution operations, which became council logistics management and then expanded the supply chain. Mm -hmm. so that's one direction we decay. Is there a new iteration of skill sets needed then beyond supply chain that, uh, to deal with all this stuff? Related to that, do you see any big changes coming for the industry? One of one of my sort of biases is that it's still pretty bereft of technology. So. I'm going to pause those two questions. You can take that any way you want to go, Mark. But there's a question from an audience member that you might be able to answer. I'll just test this out on you. 
Uh, Heidi Seaman asks, at what point will Section 301 be removed to reduce the extra cost to the consumer? Do you have any insight on that, Mark? Do you have any thoughts on uh, Section 301? I do, and and I'm, I'm not going to be able to give a whole, uh, if you will, uh, rock solid, pleasing answer to this. Right now, we are we're at the conflux of it. Look, it's up to the president to decide if he's going to listen carefully to the, the intellectual property concerns that still exist in a very large way yeah. uh, out of China. That's one, right? Because we, we found these on the framework of the challenge is we need to look at China in a couple of different ways, as our previous President Trump did. And today, we know that we have the cost challenge of being able to produce high quality items in China, but China also has tools to bring stuff here pretty cheaply. That also prevents the growth of business and, and if you will, a foundation of our business here in the U.S. to price. Sure. Heat, right. So just because the 301 tariffs cost us a lot on imports doesn't mean that everybody sees it that way. Some see it as in, wait a minute, this is a good thing because now the playing field has been leveled. So we've got things on both sides for native manufacturing, core manufacturing here in the U.S. versus the import and maybe final fit assembly or bringing in retail ready products from China into the U.S. So we get that that convergence of opinion and, and thought, right, because there's industry here that says it's a good thing. It level loaded. The other side is we've got the, the piece around, well, wait a minute, it's you know costing us more when we want to bring high cost or high value goods at lower cost. That's peace. That piece settles. The other is the political piece. So right now, midterms are just several months away. We have right. inflation in the U.S. Is this a root cause of inflation? Is it even part of it? You know, the jury's still out on that. Uh, the other part of this is that what are we going to do really in terms of the competitive landscape with China, as other countries also consider in a global economy, is what's fair, what's balanced, what's right. And I think in the end, if I were making any kind of prediction, these will not go away too quickly. There may be modifications and exclusions forthcoming. But right now we're in the period of expiration. Some of these have already expired, but it's up to the president to take administrative action. And we're, right now we're waiting. He knows we're waiting, but uh, I do not have a crystal ball that would say it's foggy at best to say what he's truly going to do. But my, if I were going to just hedge a bet, I would say that a portion or all of these are going to stay and we might see some exclusions within that, but uh, I don't think they're going to go away in, in entire. That was the best answer I've ever heard, Mark. So thank you. <laughs> I hadn't thought about all the puts and takes on that. Yeah. Um, back, back to the question. We've just got a few minutes remaining and I want to kind of get back to the question I asked you before we asked you that question, which is, you know, what do you think is next for CSCMP? In my mind, at least the global supply chain has been rocked to its core in the last five years. And for the, I don't know, 25 years I was doing it before that, it was relatively a predictable thing. And so with all of this magnitude of changes, political turmoil, economic turmoil, uh, infrastructure turmoil, do you see a new role for CSMC emerging in the future? You, you kind of alluded to it, I think, a little bit with where you're headed. But also, where do you see technology playing into all this stuff? And that may be a little self-serving since I'm a tech company, but I, I really, as I mentioned, have been kind of um, surprised that at least the global supply chain is still largely an analog business. Well, Rob, I think you would agree as much as you want to position your company in the best light possible with potential clients, right? You would agree that the most difficult implementations, and I know this from experience too, are the ones where your where your clients or your customers are not ready for an implementation. Yeah, that's right? right. You don't want to be ahead of that. So I would say that the, if you will, the foundation of any kind of innovative steps is first and foremost standardization of your supply chain processes, well documented, well understood, and then you set up to optimize. And IT technology, we cannot survive without it in supply chain. It's about efficiency, it's about opportunity, it's about visibility, it's about accuracy, it's about a lot of things that the end customer, whether it's another business, a business to business relationship or that of a business to consumer relationship exists. Look, we get on Amazon or whatever company we buy from as consumers, doesn't matter, it's agnostic, right, who it is. We expect in exchange for doing our own customer service on the we're placing the order, right? We're giving them all the details about the order, what we want. We'll do that Expect with the expectation is we want to see where our order is and we want it on time and we want it in full, right? At the price we bought. Nobody's any different than that. And we cannot do that without technology. In the international space, it becomes even more problematic. So technology has to be there for us 
as we execute from origin all the way through destination. And some supply chains are five, six, seven thousand 7,000 miles long. And you don't want to lose track of that. In fact, uh, just getting back to our, our research at CSCMP, we know and we've made the statement in our recent release of the uh, 33rd State of Logistics Report just a few weeks ago that control towers were a very high priority of supply chain leaders. And so why? Why? I want to know where my stuff is. I want to know, right? And Where's I want to have a competent team in the middle managing that. So software is critical. The, the idea around advancing software from artificial intelligence and predictive analytics all the way through machine learning, all of that, if it's not inside a supply chain, it's nowhere. It needs to be right there, right? So it's- Mark, it's, I just want to pick up on something you said because I couldn't agree with you more. And for everybody in the audience, even though I, I run a tech company, I, I couldn't agree with Mark's statement before. Before you layer on technology, make sure you've got a really solid process and standardization. And the expression we used to use, Mark, is, if, if some bad things are happening, the last thing you want to do is layer on technology and make bad things happen faster. That's right. <laughs> so uh, really good lesson for the audience there. And thanks for your take on technology. Couldn't agree more on, on all of your points. So thanks for that. We have a question here, Mark, if you don't mind. Uh, this is from Kaleem. He's saying, I love my job, but I feel stuck because the company I work for doesn't have a supply chain department. Mm -hmm. Where can I find supply chain studies and education that doesn't cost a fortune? So uh, depending on what you would like to do, uh, and where you are in your career, uh, one of the best places to go, just just and just connect with us online. If you're not a member, just to sign up, it's pretty low cost to do that. And just inquire and uh, let let the let our team know that you're interested in some uh, foundational training. We have a great course that's called Supply Chain uh, SC Pro Fundamentals. It's not certification, it's fundamentals. It's built on our certification platform, but it's not as rigorous. And it's a great, great learning tool. But just to explore everything we have in the universe, what we have uh, will definitely help you. The other thing is, if you have a specific problem you're working on or you just want to chat, I'll lend an ear to you. It's not a problem. I'll be happy to help point you in the right direction and make a connection for you. That's fantastic. Thanks for asking that question. So we've just got a few minutes left. What I, what I thought we'd do here uh, in closing is. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you want to talk to maybe about the industry in general, about CMC specifically? Again, just if you had a crystal ball and you could look out, what do you see happening for the supply chain? Because to me, we're in such an interesting time, but surely we're headed somewhere. Let me you give you thoughts. That? Yeah, let me give you a real example. Every place I go, I try to ask three questions. And that is in terms of, you know, if I'm keynoting or just and topically uh, speaking on, on a certain area. I'll ask three questions of the audience. How many people leaders are in the room? And nearly every time it's two thirds of the hands that come up. What I mean by that is those that have responsibility for other people, right? They, they have a reporting relationship. Second is how many of you have a learning and development budget to invest? And I'll say it on your A and B players. Nearly every one of the same hands come up. Then the bomb. How many of you spent at least 80% of that money investing in your A and B players in the prior year, whatever that year might be? And in this case, I'd ask 2021. And you know what it is? It's a dismal less than 5%. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know why your people might struggle, and I believe are struggling, is because two things. One is we failed to move on the continuous learning, if you will, cycle. We failed to in enhance that by investing in our people. And you might be losing those people because they feel you didn't care to invest in them in the first place. So as people leaders, one of the things I want to tell you is that one of the best, and it's a little self-serving, Rob, sorry, but it's true. I want you to really come to Nashville in September. I want you to be at this year's Edge Conference. It's going to be significantly different in a lot of ways, and it's going to be better in a lot of ways. But one thing that hasn't changed is it is the single most impactful learning environment to bring your team and to explore the 100 tracks that we have, plus this entire venue of experts like Rob and others who are there to help you solve for your problems. Because we have a three-legged stool in our business. It's academia doing the foundational work. It's business practitioners implementing. But none of us can work as practitioners without the supplier community. Very few of us own our own warehouses, our own trucks, our own IT platforms, et cetera. It's all sourced. So it's a comprehensive learning environment. And this message is specifically to people leaders. It will be one of, if not the best investments you make in 2022 to help you gain the intelligence you need, not for future innovation alone, 
but for solving problems right now in 2023. So, okay, Mark, I got to leave it there. I got to yeah. leave it there. I got one minute left, but let me, let me make three quick plugs while I've got you. So first of all, I hope you enjoyed listening to Mark as much as I have. And I hope you know I enjoy Mark so much. He's a wealth of knowledge and he gives back and he's just a great person and a great leader. So thank you very much, Mark, for being here. A uh, quick plug for the Edge Conference. I agree with them. I've been to it. It's a wonderful event. Please do everything you can to. And Nashville's a wonderful city on top of it. Can't go wrong there. Win-win. And then also, we, I, again, we'll post the uh, his website on the show notes and also links to CSMCP, some of the educational resources that he mentioned. So please check that out as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. I enjoyed having you. It's really great to be here. I hope you'll come back. I hope you'll come back soon, actually. I love it. Thanks so much. Cheers, everybody.